Hello and welcome for another Expert Insight interview. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Tom Skodidas, who's down in Australia today. How are you doing, Tom? I'm great, John. How are you? Good, good. And Tom's a general manager at iCumulus, uh, and he also had his own business for a long time. Um, I think he sold that last year. Um, and Tom and I had the pleasure of doing some panel discussions many years ago in Australia and Hong Kong, I think. Or was it Singapore? I can't remember. It was, yeah, that's right. It was. I think it was Sydney and then one other city. Yeah. And, uh, and you know we're still talking about um social selling social engagement all of these uh all of these years later so what I want to talk to Tom about is uh Tom has some great insights on into how some people when it comes to LinkedIn how some of the things that prevent them using it effectively do you want to elaborate on that Tom yeah sure there are different psychological blocks that I've encountered throughout the last 10 years of working uh, on social selling and teaching it, and also mistakes that people make that are quite common. Um, I'll give you an example, uh, John. A psychological block that I hear all the time without fail is, uh, I know I should be connecting on LinkedIn and Twitter with my my customers and, and key partners, and I'm worried that if I do, my competitors are watching and they'll see that I've connected with them, mm. and then they'll go and poach them. Right. I don't know if you've come across that one. Yeah, I, I have come across that one where people are, are kind of worried about too much exposure and the fact that it's all public, yeah. Yeah, that is a valid fear in the beginning when you first have it, but then it has to be struck down because nobody's watching. People are too busy. <laughs> uh, people don't really care. And even if you had a competitor who cared that much, even observing your account 24 hours a day, the chances of that person uh, reaching out to your customer, meeting your, your customer and poaching them are quite small. And if your customer was poached in the end because of that, it meant that their cu your customer was about to leave you anyway. Um, the benefits of connecting with all your customers far outweigh the costs of losing a customer because of competitors stalking your profile well i think if you i think if you have competitors stalking your profile it's almost like you have them on the back foot and they're spending in investing their time trying to stalk you while you're off there trying to find customers yourself so to me it kind of feels like they're in you put them on the defensive so in a way it's you should be it's a compliment that, that's right. It's they're in they're in that rear view mirror of your car. They just can't, you know, catch up. Um, a mistake that I see happening a lot, which I find personally incredibly frustrating, is when people invite you to connect on LinkedIn but don't add a personal note. Mm -hmm. I still cannot fathom the the lack of connection between real life protocol which in real life if i interrupted you john at a conference i would tap you on the shoulder very gently i would apologize for the interruption i would quickly tell you who i am why i'm here give you some context and then you would say oh don't worry about interrupting me that that makes sense thank you for giving me that context and then you would shake my hand and then we'd have a chat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's real life. But on LinkedIn, people are quite happy to just press connect, 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 connect. And they do it with people that they want to sell a million dollar deal to. Uh, I find it frustrating that LinkedIn itself hasn't pushed the personalized note opportunity to more people. Mm -hmm. But I also find it frustrating that more people haven't done enough research on the platform to discover that little button right. that that's right and and that note is just gold for connecting with people beyond those you know going into uncharted water waters with people you don't know but you should because you have so many people in common yeah it's, it's funny that you say that i think it's um it's interesting how people don't associate um, their online behavior with their offline behavior, right? They don't see that it's just another venue. And what you've just outlined there, it is literally like 
picture yourself walking into a, a networking event and just running around, just throwing your cards at people. And then, you know, just everyone you see, here, have my card, have my card. I mean, you know, you'd be like that. Yeah, everybody would be like, what a lunatic. But you do it online because it seems like that's acceptable. And it's that I, I always find it's a very strange disconnect that people have between their behavior offline and online. It, it is. And it's a wasted opportunity. And all it needs is some research on the platform. Um, on Twitter, you don't have that issue because on Twitter, you just follow someone. Mm -hmm. um, but on Twitter, uh, I also find it frustrating that when you follow someone, that more people don't follow you back. I always re try to reciprocate. Right. If someone mm -hmm. follows me and I, I, I see that person following me and I'm alerted by it, in about 80% of the cases, I will follow them back, mm -hmm. uh, even if I don't know them, because I believe in that reciprocation. So on Twitter as well, I think that there's an opportunity to build a relationship, even if it's at the early stage, by actually following people back and not just wanting to have 25,000 followers and you follow just one person. <laughs> I, I find that very arrogant. And um, I think celebrities get away with it because they're celebrities, but in the business world, we need every relationship we can build. Yeah, and I, I think that's a, I think that's a really interesting point you raise because I do think it is it is something that people do actually do. It's um, that idea of I don't want to be seen following too many people. I want to have more people following me because that somehow elevates me, as opposed to like you're saying, fine if you're a celebrity, fine if you're trying to build a reputation for something else. But if you're in the connections business, which most salespeople are, it doesn't make sense, right? That's right. Another mistake that I see, uh, and th I guess there's a psychological block as well attached to it, is specifically the, the tool of in-mail on LinkedIn. I use different lead generation approaches on LinkedIn. I use uh, first degree connection requests. I use introductions. And I also use InMail. And InMail has been thrashed by so many people. So many emails have been sent, which has caused InMail worldwide to be seen as a spam tool. Mm -hmm. um, however, when used well with the right script and the right profile, it works. And what I, what I find is that people give up because it's been used by so many people and the response rates have declined because of the mass usage and the bad usage. People will send one email. And they'll get no response. So they'll send three or five and they get no response. And then they say, yep, it's true. It's a spam tool. It doesn't work. Mm -hmm. I use it a lot. And I can tell you right now, my meeting rates from InMail range from 15 to 20 percent, mm -hmm. depending on whether I'm having a good or a bad day. <laughs> the average for me is about 17 percent. And I'll tell you what, 17 percent is phenomenal because even though... 83% of the time, I fail miserably. 17% of the time, I'm winning. Mm -hmm. And the deals that I'm making from those 17% of meetings are in the millions. So in-mail works, but you have to work it. And I love maths. I always believe in that base sample. You have to send at least 100 to actually see the true numbers coming back to you. Don't give up after sending eight of them. So, uh, so what? Why are you successful in it? Because I mean, I get I get a bunch of emails, and to be honest, I'm one of those people who rarely responds to them because they're they don't send. They're they're nothing, you know. They're just they're spam. Yes. So, what do you do that's that's different? Okay, so with email, with any marketing, the the keys are specifically in mail. Your profile has to be a strong profile. If you look like a lightweight in your field because your whole profile screams out, hire me, please, this is a resume, you're not going to get a response. You have to change your profile's mindset from I'm in here for a job to I'm serving my customer, I'm a leader, here's how I prove it by talking about my customer's needs and who I help. So the profile is number one. Number two is the script. In the script, you have to name drop people you know in common and actually explain the context. John, I can tell you right now, if I see someone that I want to approach as a prospect and I see you're a common connection, 
I'm definitely name dropping you. So sorry in advance, but it's happening. Um, but I think I've earned the right to name drop you because I've met you at the conference. We've spoken since, and now we're speaking again. So I've earned that right. So I will name drop you and tap into what cavemen have been tapping into, which is that familiarity. But people don't write the right scripts. They just write spammy scripts rather than think about an introduction and creating a warmth and then segueing into how you can help them. Mm-hmm. And number three, follow-up. 50% of all my leads through InMail come from the second InMail. So I will email John Golden on the uh, 1st of May, and then he doesn't respond. I will follow up within three to four days and gently remind John of the first InMail and pitch a shortened script the second time. And that scrapes out 50% of all my leads. So profile, script, follow-up. So how much of this do you think comes down to, uh, as I I always describe it as the shortcut culture we live in today, is where everybody's looking for shortcuts. And, And as we said, instead of you know, looking at the fact that you're still interacting with human beings um, when you're on LinkedIn or whatever. But, you know, people just want to take shortcuts. So they don't want to do what you did. They don't want to name drop when they send a, a, an email. They just want to write their their jump in, cut and paste, whatever script they send to everybody. Um, so how much do you think it's kind of these tools, um, people have seen them as shortcuts as a, rather than strategic tools? Well, the shortcut culture is alive. I think in all of us, even in you and me, for sure in me, I will admit 85% of my in-mail script is template. Mm -hmm. I don't have time to create a new script every time. But the 15% that is custom is gold because I am absolutely personalizing it. And it takes me per in-mail about five to seven minutes per person. Now, that might seem painful to many, but to me, getting a meeting with a head of marketing of a major software company is worth the yuckiness of the five, six, or seven minutes. So I am a shortcut kind of guy, but I will never dip below the minimum required per human being. And these people deserve, all of us deserve respect. Mm -hmm. Five minutes per B2B buyer I can't imagine how that's not called for. Yeah, no, I agree. No, I mean, I think it absolutely should take advantage of of the technology, and you know, and and the good shortcuts are there. But to your point, it's that it's that uh, fifteen twenty percent of personalization. Because um, I don't know how many times you've gotten an in mail, or I've gotten an in mail that has basically pitched a software tool that has nothing to do with what I do for a living or what my company does, and and you're just like. Why? <laughs> it, it is the shortcut culture. I can tell you this, that when I receive in mails that are personalized like that, I'm actually taken aback. I find them so rare that I do a double take and wonder whether the person is real or not, because I'm used to so much crap coming through. Um, but I can also tell you that despite all of my efforts to personalize, and I do it at a very professional social selling level, um, I only get a 17% response rate. And that's still tiny, but I I also think I'm a baseball fan. I think of how baseball players get into the Hall of Fame. And the Hall of Fame, what you really need is a a 0.300 batting average. So maybe a bit more, but for this example, if you can get on base three out of 10 times for for all of your career on average, you'll probably get into the Hall of Fame. Um, And for me, uh, it's funny that seven times out of 10, you're a loser and three times out of 10, you're a winner. And yet you still have a great career. So for me, a 17% in mail response rate, I'll take it because I'm meeting amazing people that are, are able to invest budget, which makes the ROI clearly worth it. So um, before we, if we go, what are, what are some other kind of common mistakes that you can highlight? So people's profiles. I find that 
on people's profiles that the, the first thing is everybody looks at your picture first. The, the first thing as mammals we do is picture. We want to identify the other mammal on the beach <laughs> and make sure that they're not a threat, that they're relevant. And people's pictures usually are not professional headshots. Uh, they're usually kind of casual or funny. It's like, you know, selfies. <laughs> yeah. And here's here's the thing. Here's where people get it wrong. I'm going to give one rule that I follow. The overarching rule of social selling is this. Who is your target audience? If you can describe them clearly, then once you describe them, ask yourself and your peers, does my picture and the rest of my profile match what my target audience would expect me to look like and speak like based on their needs. That's great. If the answer is no, my target audience would think I'm an absolute lightweight. Then you need to overhaul your profile. If you, however, believe that your profile matches your target audience's expectations, then you're winning. Most people tell me, Tom, uh, thanks for the advice. Uh, I'm happy with my picture. Piss off. <laughs> and I, I say to them, I'll piss off, but here's the thing. If you're happy with your picture, and I personally think it's crap, um, you've succeeded in satisfying your target audience's needs. But in your case, your target audience is just you. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're in social selling to make yourself feel great, you've succeeded, I'll shut up. But if you're telling me that you're trying to impress and engage chief executive officers in the financial services industry, you are failing. Therefore, you should trust me and change that picture and actually look like someone who is consistent with their target audience's needs. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. I'm, I, I'm 150% agree. And especially, I mean, okay, once upon a time, maybe people could make the argument, well, getting a professional headshot, it's really expensive and all of that. But to be honest, nowadays, it's not. And in fact, um, I've seen places local to me that advertise need a need a social media headshot and they're doing it for like 30 bucks or 40 bucks or whatever. And I think, yeah, if you can't, and even if it costs a little more, even if it's 100, 150 or whatever, if you don't think that that is a good investment, because let's face it, you know, we, we use our headshots for probably a little longer than we should normally yes, <laughs> for a number of years. Yes. Um, but um, I think it's an absolute, it's, a, it's an investment that you have to make because I do think it screams immediately out at you it jumps out at you if you can see well that's a one taken by your phone or the the best one is when the other person is kind of half cropped out of it you know so you've kind of half removed the other people from the picture i just think i just think it's one of the best uh if it's a if 50 100 150 dollars or whatever the equivalent is globally i think if you spend that on a good headshot it'll stand to you agreed and the other thing about profiles that i find a, a real ball drop moment is profiles allow you to upload videos mm -hmm. and videos are the ultimate demand generation lead generation tool um, even if they're not lead generating they're demand generating if they're not demand generating they're lead generating you can't lose you can't you can't lose unless the video is poor obviously but assuming you work for a major brand with a library of videos i think everyone even if they have a poor profile, can uplift their profile immediately just by uploading a thoughtful, professional uh, piece of content, video ideally, that they can take from their company's YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. Great mm -hmm. opportunity to show that you're digitally savvy. In fact, I've seen people who have incredible videos in an otherwise terrible profile, which to me is funny because it, it makes them look like they're so smart that they don't need to actually have a good profile because they're so cool. Yeah. Um, and I, because I, their videos are great. 
I love that on, on video. I agree with you. And I think that anybody who hasn't put video on their profile now, that's one of the things you should immediately go out and do because I guarantee you, you will get more engagement off of that video than you will from anything else you do on your website. I always tell people, don't worry about posting content if you haven't. Don't feel bad. The most important piece of content you'll ever post, ever, is your own profile. Mm -hmm. Because if your profile is a great piece of content, then you're actually posting it every time you invite people to connect because they're going to check you out. So I tell people, get over this fear about, you know, I'm crap at sharing content. I don't share once a week. Uh, I must be crap. No, you're not. You're, you're, you're fine. Get that one piece of content right. All right. Before we go, Tom, I just want to give you a chance to tell people a little bit more about yourself and about, the, uh, about your company and how they can find out more. I work for Accumulus. We're a digital marketing agency in Sydney. There's a B2C side and the B2B side. I head up the B2B side. Uh, I, I love B2B, always have. And um, we work with large uh, corporate brands, uh, software, financial services on demand generation and lead generation using social and digital. Great. Well, listen, thanks, Tom. It's a great conversation as always. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeline of CRM. See you all again soon. Thank you. So I encourage you to subscribe to salespop.net, the online sales magazine. Also subscribe to our YouTube channel and then comment. Get involved in the conversation. Love to hear what you have to say.